Welcome. My name is Ajay Kirthane from Columbia University Medical Center, and it's a real honor for me today to be able to chair the symposium titled A Review of the Radiance HTN Global Clinical Trial Program, a focus on the TRIO cohort. We have three great speakers lined up today. Um, we also have a live chat master, uh, Professor Melvin Lobo. So please remember to chat in the session and he will answer your questions. Um, the three talks are essentially starting off with just a background, the Paradise Ultrasound Renal Denervation, history of the field. No one better to present that than Professor Felix Mafoud. I will then present to you data from the Radiance HTN TRIO trial, which was recently um, reported at the ACC and published in The Lancet. And then Professor Lobo will take this and interpret it and talk to us about what this trial may mean for the field and who's going to be the right patients for the therapy of renal denervation. I'll then summarize with some key learnings. And with that, let's launch this symposium. It's, a, it's really an honor to be here at EuroPCR. Hope to see everybody in person, but for now, this will have to suffice. So with that, let's go to Professor Mafoud. Welcome and hello. It is my great privilege now to discuss with you uh, the Paradise Ultrasound Renal Denervation System, the history of the field, potential benefits of ultrasound, and um, an overview of the Paradise system. These are my potential conflicts of interest. Well, we're targeting the renal sympathetic nervous system, and they are divided into afferent nerves connecting the kidney with the brain. And on the other way, we see renal efferent nerves connecting the central nervous system with the kidneys. They trigger renin release and thereby RAS activation, sodium retention, and renal blood flow is reused whenever renal efferent nerves are uh, activated. On the other hand, the afferent nerves contribute to central sympathetic nervous system activity. And of course, the sympathetic nervous system activity can then increase heart rate, um, increase contractility, and um, trigger vasoconstriction and vascular hypertrophy. So the renal sympathetic nerves are indeed an attractive target. And as early as uh, 1953, um, a large case series of patients undergoing open surgical sympathectomy for malignant hypertension was published in JAMA. And this picture here shows um, Dr. Smithwick, who was on the, um, on the forefront actually to develop this uh, surgery, where they cut all um, sympathetic nerves that they thought are renal sympathetic nerves. It was a quite uh, progressive operation that had serious side effects, but nevertheless, they showed that uh, indeed when you cut the sympathetic nerves, you reduce blood pressure in certain patients and you improve survival by almost 50%. Shown here are uh, the uh, survival curves of patients according to various blood pressure levels at baseline. And when you compare group three here, you can appreciate that there was an almost 50% increase in survival in those patients undergoing surgery. And this was, of course, related also to the fact that there were very, very few alternative um, approaches to lower blood pressure uh, besides uh, uh, dietary restrictions. And with the progression and the development of antihypertensive agents, this was left, but um, it shows the importance of the renal sympathetic nerves and what happens when their activity is reduced using a surgery. So given the um, early human data, but also um, a, a great amount of preclinical evidence, all in support of the importance of the renal sympathetic nerves, not only for hypertension, but also for heart failure and chronic kidney disease, the first patient was treated using a catheter-based approach where a radio frequency device was, ent was entered into the renal arteries and um, decreased sympathetic activity. And then the uh, first randomized trial was published in November 2010, the Simplicity HTN2 trial, where huge blood pressure reductions were documented in patients undergoing radio frequency renal denervation, but not in patients who were treated with medication only. This, of course, created a, a, a great enthusiasm and hope, actually, that uh, this technology may represent um, a cure of hypertension. And then this was um, uh, suddenly disrupted, actually, with the publication of uh, the Simplicity HDN3 trial, a trial where 
there was no significant difference between sham treated and uh, uh, renal denervation patients in uh, this larger study. Well, what uh, has been done then by um, consensus groups around the world was a reappraisal of renal denervation. We call it RDN 2.0, where a better understanding uh, of the ultimate target, the anatomy of the renal nerves, improved devices and um, treatment recommendations, but also a better understanding in trial designs um, regarding medication and confounding of medication endpoint and patient selection. All these were um, important confounding factors identified in early studies, and they were addressed in the most recent trials um, that were uh, actually in part now um, published. Well, as said, a better understanding of the an anatomical target, the nerve distribution along the renal artery is shown here. And initially, we thought we have to treat as proximal as possible because the density of the nerves is highest in the proximal part of the renal arteries. But indeed, we learned that the nerves are getting closer to the lumen in the distal segment. And we also learned that circumferential treatment is most important to affect a significant amount of uh, uh, renal arteries. And the major outcome of this um, human study, I think, is that um, almost 90, 95% of all nerves are located within a depth of six millimeters. So that is indeed how deep we have to get to a decreased sympathetic activity. The Paradise Ultrasound Renal Denervation System is designed to maximize the potential of renal denervation with a quite straightforward and a simplified procedure that uses ultrasound technology. It um, comes with a circumferential sonification to uh, completely ablate the nerves located in the peri-arterial space. We have a target ablation depth of uh, six millimeter in deep. Everything is automated, including the energy delivery. And um, the procedure is straightforward because it um, has only seven seconds sonication um, and we typically perform two to three sonications per renal artery. This is an example here of the system where you can see that various catheters can be connected and automatically the target depth is then selected by the generator. You can accommodate uh, vessel sizes of three to eight millimeters. And again, we aim at ablating in a depth of one to six millimeters to ensure that a significant amount of nerves is indeed hit. This is shown here. As said, 80% of the nerves can be targeted with an emission that um, goes as deep as six millimeter. And this is irrespective of the location along the renal artery. So you can um, perform treatments proximally in the middle segment, but also distally and you will affect a significant amount of nerves with this a catheter. Another important feature is the arterial wall protection um, because during energy emission, there is cold fluid circulating uh, through a balloon that protects the endothelium, which is an important feature of this catheter. And this is shown nicely here in this um, thermal gel actually that turns opaque where when it is heated up, and you can see the donut that is indeed created here, um, confirming the circumferential ablation that is being performed here. But you can also appreciate that there is a space actually around the balloon uh, that is not turning opaque, indicating that this is then protected by the cold fluid um, that is circulating through the balloon. We have uh, plenty of mechanical evidence showing the circumferentiality, but also showing that indeed the renal arterial wall is protected from thermal energy, which is an important feature as said of this catheter. The Paradise Renal Denervation System is designed for short and simple procedure. You can see that we're again uh, performing two to three emissions per artery, seven seconds each, and we're also treating the accessory arteries in case they supply more than 20% of the kidney parenchyma, because we know from preclinical work that these accessory arteries carry sympathetic nerves and contribute to renal sympathetic activity. Preclinical evidence indeed indicates that whenever we ablate two to three times per renal artery, we can decrease kidney 
um, no adrenaline tissue concentration by almost 90-95%. In summary, a better understanding of the ultimate target, the renal sympathetic nerves, new devices, techniques, and technologies, and an improved trial design have led to uh, a couple of positive trials, all indicating that renal denervation indeed can lower blood pressure in patients with uncontrolled hypertension. The Paradise Ultrasound Renal Denervation System delivers circumferential energy in an ablation depth of one to six millimeters to efficiently target and ablate the renal sympathetic nerves. It protects the arterial wall and non-target tissues. It requires a quite short ablation time of seven seconds, and it is a straightforward procedure from a technical point of view for the operator requiring only minimal training. Thank you very much for listening. Hi, my name is Ajay Kirthne from Columbia University Medical Center. It's my honor to be able to present to you data from Radiance HTN Trio, uh, both the study design and discussion of its primary analysis and outcomes. Here are my disclosures. Most germane to this talk uh, is that my institutions have received uh, research funding from Recore Medical. The Recore Global Clinical Trial Program is shown here in this slide, and it essentially includes studies like single arm studies to demonstrate feasibility of this device for lowering blood pressure, and then prospectively powered randomized clinical trials. These include Radiance HTN Solo and what will be the pivotal FDA approval trial for this device, the Radiance 2 study, but also includes the trial that I'm going to be showing you today, Radiance HTN Trio, which is a study looking at a sham controlled way at the use of this technology in patients with resistant hypertension. This also sets the stage for future studies that will be coming out in specific subgroups of patients that might benefit from this type of technology, and then other indications as well, such as atrial fibrillation and potentially heart failure. For Radiance HTN Trio, the background of the study and objectives were that we knew that endovascular renal denervation could reduce blood pressure in patients with mild to moderate hypertension from the Radiance HTN Solo study. But its blood pressure lowering effect has not been previously demonstrated with confidence in patients with resistant hypertension. So our study's objective was to investigate whether this technology could reduce daytime ambulatory systolic blood pressure in patients with hypertension that were resistant to a standardized fixed dose triple medication pill. This is the device that was investigated within the study. Percutaneous access is obtained. The device is advanced over a wire into the main renal arteries. And using ultrasonic heating, a ring of ablative energy with a depth of one to six millimeters is used to interrupt renal nerve traffic. There's a cooling balloon to protect the lumen, and that's uh, very important in terms of safety. And ultimately, two to three sonications, each lasting only seven seconds, are delivered to each main renal artery, and you effectively get a circumferential pattern of ablation, shown here in yellow, with this blue cooling to preserve the arterial lumen. Now, Radius HTN Trio was a blinded sham controlled study that was powered to demonstrate a decrease in blood pressure from baseline to two months after denervation versus a sham control. In order to get into the study, patients had to have elevated blood pressures despite being on three or more medications at the start of the study. After being eligible and confirmed to be so, these patients were started on a single fixed dose combination pill. So they were taken off their home regimen and put on a single pill to standardize therapy throughout the study across both arms. Once their blood pressure was ascertained to be elevated despite being on this single pill, they were then uh, subjected to non-invasive testing to determine whether their anatomy was eligible for renal denervation. And if it was, they came to the catheterization laboratory and underwent denervation versus a sham control. And the entire procedure was blinded with headphones, blinders on, and patients were unaware of their treatment assignment um, through this follow-up period. At two months, the primary endpoint was ascertained, and this was a drop in daytime ambulatory systolic blood pressure. Of note, a few key points are that medication changes were not permitted once patients were on that triple combination pill at a stable dose, except if they needed rescue for very elevated blood pressures. And both the patients and the outpatient assessors were blinded to the treatment assignment in this study. Now, while I'm presenting the primary results at two months, we're following these patients through longer term follow up out to five years after medication titration to also evaluate durability and safety of this approach. 
Here's the patient flow of the study with a total of almost 1,000 patients enrolled and ultimately 136 underwent randomization. And the reason for this is important, and that is that when we started patients on the single combination pill, there were many patients whose blood pressures were controlled to the point where they would no longer be eligible for the study. Randomized, and only those that were truly resistant despite the single therapy were ultimately randomized if they had suitable anatomy. In this study, 67 patients were assigned to sham, 69 were assigned to real derivation. We had complete follow up of ABPMs at two months for all patients in the sham arm, and we had that ABPM data for all but six patients in the derivation arm. But from an analytical perspective, as pre specified in the protocol, if we're missing ABPMs, we imputed a zero change in their blood pressure. So no effect of the therapy in the most conservative way um, in the spirit of intent to treat analyses. As far as the patient's enrollment that came into the study, the mean age was approximately just over 50. Approximately 20% of patients were women, 20% of patients identified as black. And there were a host of comorbidities that were present to a greater extent than perhaps in other studies because of the nature of this patient population, those with resistant hypertension. So there were patients who had had diabetes, there were patients with a history of heart failure, those who had had prior hospitalizations even for hypertensive crises. Now, when we first screened these patients for eligibility, their blood pressure was quite elevated, 160 systolic, despite being on um, an average of four medications. If one looks at the distribution of the medications seen within the study, they were by and large guideline-directed medications, and in fact, 30% or more patients were on an aldosterone antagonist at baseline as well. These patients were then taken off that regimen that they were on at home and started on a single combination pill. So a single pill containing an ARB amlodipine hydrocorthizide, as shown here in this slide. Um, in addition, there was a smattering of beta blocker use for prior clinical indications necessary. But what was also unique about this study in contradistinction to others before it is that we measured the urine to determine that patients were actually taking this therapy after four weeks. And remarkably, almost 80% of patients were adherent to the treatment regimen. Now, some would say that that means 20% were not adherent, and that's exactly true, but this is far better than what we would expect in routine clinical practice, and I think is a testament to the hard work of the investigators and the rigor of the study design. After patients were on this medication, those that successfully underwent randomization still had elevated blood pressures with blood pressures in the 150s, irrespective of how you measured it, whether it was ABPM, home, or office blood pressure. When they came to the cardiac catheterization laboratory fully blinded, an angiogram was performed in both arms. The patients who underwent denervation had longer procedures because they ultimately went denervation in addition to the angiogram. But the denervation was successful in 97% of cases, all but two cases. We had bilateral denervations with over two ablations on each side. The emission times themselves were relatively short, in fact, less than a minute, um, but the procedure times were longer because of the, um, of the need to cannulate the renal arteries and advance the catheters into their adequate position. Now, notably, despite the fact that the times were different between these two procedures, formal blinding assessments confirmed that patients did not know which therapy they received, either at discharge or even at two-month follow-up. And so that's an important part of this study and its sham control design. Here's the primary efficacy endpoint, which is the change in daytime ambulatory blood pressure at six months from baseline. And on the left is the intent to treat analysis, which demonstrated a drop of eight millimeters of mercury in these resistant hypertensive patients from their baseline with denervation, a three millimeter drop with sham um, for a median between group difference of 4.5 millimeters of mercury. Now, some of the drop in the sham arm may be due to rescue that occurred um, in, in those uh, types of patients um, because uh, and also other medications that were added back to them. And when we take out the patients that actually did not have MBPM data at two months, and in fact, we imputed them to have a zero change, you see the difference is even more pronounced among all those that had complete ABPMs in favor of denervation versus sham. Here are more granular data showing the ABPM profiles at baseline in two months, once again demonstrating not only a drop in daytime ambulatory systolic blood pressure, but also nighttime ambulatory pressure, which also favored denervation versus sham and exemplifies the quote-unquote always-on effect of this type of device. Similar results were seen in the complete ABPM population, uh, perhaps even more pronounced. 
For even more granular data, these are the individual patient responses for all patients that have ambulatory blood pressure monitoring within the trial. And what one can appreciate is there is more of a drop seen with denervation across the board than compared to sham. And no matter how we cut these drops at, at, at unity, at five millimeters of mercury or at 10 millimeters of mercury, all of these drops favor denervation compared to sham. If we were to sort of say that control is defined by a daytime ambulatory blood pressure of less than 135 over 85, we would see that that drop occurred more frequently with denervation compared to sham within the study. The changes in office and home blood pressure largely paralleled the overall results. Home blood pressure was borderline significant um, due to sample size largely, um, but these results were consistent uh, irrespective of how blood pressure was taken. Now, as far as medication adherence goes, remarkably within the trial, it was good at 75%. Of note, because we know patients sometimes are not as adherent as we'd like to think, there may be patients who were adherent at baseline who were not adherent later or vice versa. And despite these changes over time, we were able to demonstrate this effect in the trial. Now, as far as subgroup analyses go, in the pre-specified subgroups that we studied, there was no difference in treatment effect across the range of subgroups overall. And moving to safety, we found that GFR was stable in both arms at zero and two months. Of course, longer term is data. Uh, longer term data is needed to ensure this is the case for uh, longer term follow up. And for major adverse events, there were no significant differences between denervation and sham, with one um, death that was not related to the procedure as adjudicated by an independent physician one doubling of plasma creatinine that occurred after initiation of spironolactone that then resolved with discontinuation, and one um, access site pseudoaneurysm that uh, required a thrombin injection to treat. The limitations of this study should be noted, and that, number one, is that additional follow-up is going to be required to determine whether the effect is not only durable, but also safe, especially in conjunction with additional medications that might be added to control these patients further, such as the aldosterone antagonist spironolactone. In addition, because there's no pre-procedural marker that can predict um, outcomes and there's no intra-procedural marker that tells the physician that they've actually completed a successful denervation, we do expect that between patient variability will continue to be observed even if the technique is applied as it was within this clinical trial. That having been said, these data are remarkably consistent with the data from Radiance HTN Solo demonstrating very similar reductions in blood pressure across two different populations of patients, one that were taken off medications in Solo and one that was on a single standardized combination pill and Radiance HTN Trio. They're also consistent with other devices of other technologies such as from the Spiral HTN program. So in conclusion from Radiance HTN Trio, I think we can say with confidence that in patients with hypertension that's resistant to guideline recommended triple combination therapy administered in a single pill, ultrasound-based renal denervation was associated with a reduction of eight millimeters of mercury in daytime ambulatory systolic blood pressure, which represented a 4.5 millimeters of mercury greater decrease than the sham procedure. The greater blood pressure lowering effect of denervation versus sham was consistent not just for daytime pressure, but also for 24-hour, nighttime, and office systolic blood pressure. These results are concordant with those of Radiance HTN Solo, which was conducted in patients with mild to moderate hypertension, and thereby confirm that ultrasound renal denervation can lower blood pressure across a spectrum of hypertension. We do need longer-term assessments for efficacy as well as safety, and these are ongoing and will continue. And finally, I do want to thank all the Radiance HTN Trio study centers. This was not an easy trial to enroll in, not only because of the types of patients involved, the sham control, the COVID-19 pandemic, all of these things that contributed to make it challenging and yet to be able to get this over the finish line uh, on behalf of Michelle Azizi, who's been a mentor to me and uh, ultimately really helped design the study along with Laura Mori and is the first author of the Lancet publication. It's really my pleasure to be able to pr present these results and I just want to congratulate everybody for the hard work that they put in. Thanks so much for your time and happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present this talk at EuroPCR 2021. The title of the talk is given there, and these are my disclosures. Uh, we are considering uh, the TRIO data set and what it means for the field, who is the right patient for this therapy, and importantly, you've already had a presentation on the data, so we're not going to reiterate that. I have to consider what this means from a patient perspective and also from the perspective of what the field uh, thinks about these uh, data, 
Uh, this refers to referrers and people that pay for the um, technology, ultimately healthcare commissioners, and people that will uh, be the ones that request patients to have it, the hypertension specialists as well. And importantly, another question is, who is the right patient for this therapy? And my belief here is that one has to consider the evidence. And the evidence is shown in the following two slides. First of all, Radiance HTN Trio has shown that renal denervation with ultrasound is effective in a population with resistant hypertension treated with a single pill combination formulation with three active ingredients with a blood pressure reduction compared to placebo um, that you see on the left-hand side of the slide, and importantly in the right-hand side of the slide with a per-protocol population, what we can see is that blood pressure reduction during the daytime uh, hits almost 10 millimeters of mercury uh, ambulatory systolic blood pressure change. That's a very substantial reduction, in my opinion, and very promising for the field. Now, taking the totality of data that we have with, on the left, ultrasound-based renal denervation, on the right, radiofrequency renal denervation with the spiral catheter, we now have two separate or, or even three separate populations in whom renal denervation is proven to work. We have an unmedicated patient population on the left-hand side here and here, in whom both radiance and spiral studies have shown blood pressure reduction. And importantly, with radiance solo, we see extended blood pressure reduction <coughs> out to 12 months. That's been published, along with uh, very encouraging safety data. We have a resistant hypertensive population in whom the therapy has worked, uh, proven in the Radiance HTN TRIO study. And we have a patient population with uncontrolled hypertension in uh, whom the spiral HTN ONMED study showed a substantial blood pressure reduction following renal denervation. So this really opens up the right kind of patient for renal denervation as being either non-medicated or having resistant or uncontrolled hypertension in a setting where other approaches are perhaps either non-desirable or have not worked. Now, what is the patient's perspective on all of this? Very important because what we've come to realize is that patients aren't quite as honest with us about their adherence to antihypertensive medication as we would like to believe. The truth is that there is a very, very big issue around the world with covert non-adherence to antihypertensive medication. That means the patients don't declare that they're not taking their medication, but we find out about it because when we do studies such as measuring urine drug metabolites or active ingredients, we're seeing that there aren't active drugs in the urine, even though the patients claim to be taking the drugs. And this is very clearly an issue that increases as we increase the number of antihypertensive pills. So increasing medication burden seems to beget increasing non-adherence. And this will be a cause of failure to achieve hypertension control, which leads to cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. A very important but not as prevalent issue is of overt non-adherence, where the patients tell us that they can't take their antihypertensive medication either because they don't want to or because they're having significant side effects. And these side effects are important in day-to-day -day life, for instance, erectile dysfunction, hair loss, leg swelling. These are things that patients will use as an excuse to stop taking the medication, and then the physician has the challenge to find an alternative. What is really clear now is that there are no proven measures to improve adherence in either two of these groups in the long term that result in long-term blood pressure reduction. There are a number of different ways of addressing non-adherence, a lot of them around monitoring of medications usage, and then some of them around specific interventions to increase adherence. But at the present time, we only have short-term data to show modest improvement in BP control with these approaches and no sustained long-term uh, data is available. It is quite possible that the use of single pill combination formulations will improve non-adherence in the long term. Uh, there are issues here, however, with regards to cost and who will pay for these therapies uh, and their availability in different geographies. And even on that note, on this next slide, a very important uh, uh, set of studies is demonstrated here with uh, one group of patients re represented by the red line 
uh, showing nearly 5,000 patients in 21 studies uh, in which once daily antihypertensive drugs were assessed in phase four and uh, patients were surveilled using continuous electric monitoring. And in another set of studies here in more than 100,000 patients in which real life adherence was monitored by using prescription refill records. And what's very important here is that both sets of studies indicate a very substantial reduction in the proportion of patients taking their antihypertensive medication according to these methods of monitoring by one year of use. Uh, and it, there is no real difference between patients uh, in clinical trial settings or patients in real life settings, indicating that all of our assumptions about patient adherence uh, have to be taken with a great pinch of salt. And really, non-persistence is going to be a major reason for failure to maintain hypertension control to target in the population. Now, patient preference is also uh, expressed other than the fact that they don't take their medications with the use of studies such as this from um, Roland Schmieder and colleagues, indicating that whether or not um, you have severe hypertension, modest hypertension, or borderline hypertension, there is increasing interest from patients in the concept of using a non-drug approach to treat blood pressure. So this is attitudes to renal denervation in a population when considering most recent systolic blood pressure on the top part of the slide. In the second half of the slide, we see uh, patient attitudes based upon the number of antihypertensive medications they're taking. And not surprisingly, there is a big step up in increase in renal denervation, the more tablets you're taking. But quite uh, notably, we have more than half of patients who are not medicated for hypertension, who are very keen to consider renal denervation um, even uh, without having had antihypertensive medication already. And what this is telling us is that patients don't want to be medicated lifelong for an asymptomatic disorder and run the risk of uh, regular medications taking and potential side effects. This is a very important finding. Now, when one considers the larger uh, field of hypertension specialists and commissioners, what are the attitudes uh, amongst those? Well, we have guidance from the European Society of um, Hypertension and European Society of Cardiology from 2018, shown in this panel here, uh, considering the data prior to the release of the TRIO, SOLO, and SPIRAL studies, in which the class of recommendation for renal denervation was actively negative, not to use, uh, and the level of evidence that was considered uh, was only grade B. Subsequently, uh, guidance from both the UK and the Europe has considered the more recent trial data sets with spiral and radiance programs. And we felt in the UK 2019 consensus statement that there was still further evaluation of the therapy warranted, given that we only had very short-term data at that point and that renal denervation would not be um, um, offered as a standard of care to patients outside of the context of clinical trials. Um, and the European consensus that followed uh, in 2020 also made a similar statement and felt that there were uh, important caveats whereby we needed to uh, identify um, intraprocedural success uh, and also um, completeness of ablation and also to be better at identifying predictors of response. Now, this all antedates um, the current uh, time. Uh, in the current time, we have an emerging perspective led by colleagues from both Asia and Europe, in which the approach to renal denervation clearly seems to be opening up, and we have a significant relaxing in the um, standards in the sense that there seem to be more patients that could be considered for renal denervation, particularly in this Asian statement, which le likes to entertain a phenotype of sympathetic hyperactivity as being most suited to renal denervation, which makes a lot of sense. They've advocated patients with resistant hypertension and patients with these sympathetic phenotypes of morning hypertension, nocturnal hypertension, and sleep apnea syndrome, as well as recognizing that BP variability syndromes and orthostatic hypertension uh, are sympathetically driven and may respond to renal denervation. This therefore opens up the field quite wide. And in addition to this, they've considered patients who might have uncontrolled hypertension with high levels of cardiovascular risk. Now, what's important about this statement is there seems to be a relaxation uh, of attitudes towards renal denervation and more, um, I guess, uh, uh, 
sympathy towards the fact that uh, renal denervation should be offered to patients in routine clinical care, but there's no mention of how this may be paid for. Uh, when one considers the perspective from Italy, a slightly more holistic approach is mandated here, whereby shared care decision-making um, crops in uh, when patients have been assessed in a renal denervation specialist centre. And I think that this is definitely the way forward, allowing for a multidisciplinary type approach to renal denervation that involves a patient. And finally, um, this was very neatly summarised by Roland Schmieder and colleagues in this uh, recent study um, with an overall template for patient um, care that involves a patient physician uh, shared decision making process, taking into account patient pre preferences. Importantly, the experiences of the patient, if they've had a previous cardiovascular event, will shape their thinking as well as whether or not they've had side effects from medications and their own perceptions to hypertension as a risk state. When this is combined with the physician's uh, assessment of the case, particularly for patients who seem to be at higher risk with higher levels of blood pressure, taking more medications to which they're likely to be non-adherent, we then have a powerful tool for coming towards a shared decision. Importantly, the physician's recommendation is the single most important factor influencing the patient. And I'll end on that note there. Thank you very much. Well, I think we had three excellent uh, talks in terms of talking about briefly about the uh, science behind renal denervation and specifically the Paradise technology, differentiating the technology as a circumferential ablation. Uh, we then heard data from the Radiance HTN Trio study. We didn't talk about the Radiance HTN Solo study, which had already been presented, demonstrating a reduction in blood pressure with denervation compared to sham in an off-med population of patients with mild to moderate hypertension. Now with the solo and trio data together, we really see that there is a benefit to this technology across the range and the spectrum of hypertensive patients. We then spoke about the clinical applicability of this. And in the real world with someone like Professor Lobo, who takes care of these patients routinely, what the potential benefit of a denervation procedure could be. We do know that we need to identify longer-term safety data and efficacy data to be certain that these benefits can be actually realized, but those data are being collected and we'll sort those things out as time goes on. That having been said, uncontrolled hypertension is a major public health problem. And despite all of our best efforts with lifestyle modification, medications, and otherwise, there are patients who still remain uncontrolled. And for these types of patients, for those who don't want to take medicines or have side effects from them, or frankly take them but still have uncontrolled blood pressure, denervation may be a great option. So with these three talks, we, I think, hopefully in 2021 can understand where the role of this technology is. The, it is, this is not over. We have more trials to do, more ongoing studies, more future studies and then ultimately approvals of these technologies um, to then be able to bring them into your hands in the clinic. But for the time being, it's just been an honor to be here today. We miss seeing everybody. Um, one of the best times of the year is Paris in the spring. We look forward to coming back hopefully next year. Uh, but thank you for listening in the interim. And on behalf of Professors Mafood, Lobo, and myself, as well as the sponsor, Recor Medical, and the PCR team, thanks so much. I'll be signing off now. Thank you.